welcome to Resilience Unraveled. I'm your host, Dr. Russell Thackeray. This podcast is the result of my fascination with health issues, resilience, performance, mental health, accountability and critical thinking, along with many of the other obsessions I bump into in my life. I spend my time working with highly successful teams, organisations and people, and this podcast introduces their remarkable stories, as well as my synthesis of the key issues, tips and strategies to thrive in life. If you find this podcast useful, you can also find other information at qedod.com or russellthackeray.com. Stay tuned to the end for details of how to order a free ebook. Enjoy the podcast. So today I'm talking to Carl Benfield. Carl's got a very interesting background, and I'm sure we're going to have a ton to talk about. And um, a background which actually lends itself to formalised resilience. And I'm sure, um, you know, he's going to break many of the stereotypes that exist around the job he's done. And uh, he's going to give us an insight into how his current, work, his current path has been enlightened and informed by the, um, his previous career. So good morning, Carl. Good morning, Russell. Nice to be here. Um, good to talk to you. And where in the world are you today? I'm in Ashby de la Zouche, which is in the heart of the French Midlands. It's sort of equidistant from Birmingham, Nottingham, Derby and Leicester. So smack bang in the middle of the country. Well, and we're obviously talking about the UK then. Uh, yes, indeed. Fantastic. Well, it's great to talk to you. And um, Carl, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you, how do you describe what it is you do? Okay, uh, well, I run a uh, small consultancy company that uh, specializes in strategy for SMEs. So, uh, it, and strategy always sounds a bit sort of grandiose. It's, it's effectively saying, where do you want to get to and how are you going to get there? That's, that's pretty much what it is. Um, and so, uh, uh, <laughs> without making it sound, sound too simple, there are some sort of tools and techniques that we, that we use to, uh, to get people to where they want to be. Yeah, that's great. I mean, certainly in terms of our resilience model, we talk a lot about this sense of purpose, mm-hmm, and know, yeah. knowing what you're doing and doing what you're doing on purpose. So it absolutely links um, across the worlds of personal resilience and organizational resilience. So that's really great. So, um, so, so how did you get to where you are today? Oh, well, there's a, there's a potentially long story. Um, my background's in engineering, so I, I graduated in engineering and system, systems engineering. I then joined the army, and I was in the army for 16 years as an officer. And in the army, uh, as an engineering officer, you, you tend to do lots of different things. So I've done um, battlefield engineering, rolling around the planes in tanks. Uh, I've done construction, uh, power engineering. I've done engineer intelligence. Uh, and uh, worked in multinational headquarters and so on. So that that was a very broad uh, learning experience. And then I left the army after 16 years and went into renewable energy, which is a very brutal experience. Uh, Set up my own company after a couple of years and ran that for nine years. Uh, sadly, that went under last year, which I can go into a little bit more later, and that that certainly um, impacts on resilience. Uh, and uh, and now I'm doing uh, consultancy. So uh, yeah, it's a fairly fairly broad background, but um, uh, uh, started off in the military. Excellent. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Um, sure. So you say you're an officer in the army. How does that work? Do you do you join the army as an officer? Is that how it works? That's right. Yeah. So um, out of university, straight into Sandhurst. It's a year long training uh, course at Sandhurst. And then uh, following that, it's uh, another seven months as a young, as a engineering officer course. So there's a lot of training. Mm. And then throughout the, throughout the whole career, the, the army's very blessed in that, that it, and the forces generally are very blessed in that they, they're able to spend a lot of time training. Mm. Uh, so, you know, for instance, when I was, uh, let me see, 30, 30 ish, um, I did another year long course, which is called Staff College, uh, which is for more senior officers. Uh, again, uh, a full year, full time, a bit like doing an MBA, but this was with um, uh, 40 uh, different nations, about 300, 350 um, officers from around the world. And, and that was an interesting course because uh, uh, day two of the course was 9 11. So uh-huh. there we were with all of these uh, multinational officers in our syndicate rooms of, of about 10 people, all watching the Twin Towers um, and going, okay, the, the world has changed. Yeah. Uh, so it was, a, it was a fascinating course. So the day two of the course that happened, and, and suddenly the whole course was rapidly got rewritten to cope with the new threat. Yes. Yeah. 
That's fascinating. It's, it's, uh, I wonder how many people can still remember where they were when the Twin Towers were going down. I, 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 yeah, I may imagine everyone can. It's, it was such yeah. a shocking moment, wasn't it? Yeah, interesting. And so um, the, the Army is very, uh, as you say, very big into training. And it's, it's sort mm-hmm. of the leadership training as well as, you know, some more the, the, the mechanics of the, the actual role. So yeah. uh, what, what, are the sorts, what are the sort of big, the big picture ideas that the Army trains around leadership? Well, that's really good. And, and, and there's lots of different theories and, and, the, and the army is very good at coming up with, you know, di- different quotes, some of them less helpful than others, quite, quite frankly. Uh, there's one uh, from uh, General Slim who said, leadership is just plain you, which I thought was the, the most useless, useless thing I was ever taught. Um, but there's some other really good stuff. And, and one of the things I always take away is uh, the, the motto for Santos, which is where the officer's officer training is, is serve to lead. And uh, I, I think that is a great um, expression, and, and and this whole idea of servant leadership is is really strong. Um, and it, you could see it quite a lot throughout your career that you know the officers who genuinely looked after their subordinates were very well respected and very well liked, but didn't have to try and be liked. And I think that's the key. You could see some officers who would be you know trying to you know get amongst the boys and you know and and uh, and be one of the lads so to speak yeah. uh, and and they don't want that you know the, i think subordinates in any organization don't necessarily want to feel like they're best mates with their boss but they want to respect their boss they want that they and they want the boss to be looking after them and that's that's the key difference that servant leadership is i think is really really powerful um and requires uh, uh, when I say self-confidence, I mean that in the way that, um, it, you know, not, not, um, uh, uh, um, arrogance. A, 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 arrogance or extroverts mm. and noise, but just a, a calmness in yourself that you, you can, you can be vulnerable, you know, appear vulnerable, or you can, um, you know, you, you, you you don't see it as weak to be looking after people. It's a, it's, it's a very much a position of strength. And, and so, I mean, certain leaderships grab the headlines. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there's a lot of, I mean, need to say there's about 40 million consultants now offering servant leadership yeah. courses. Yeah. But I mean, you're right, it did seem to come out of the army. So what, what is the, what, going back to the roots of it, what is the sort of big idea? Well, I think it's the, in order to lead people into very difficult situations, there has to, and of course, the, you know, the military goes into very difficult situations, very risky situations. You have to have a very, very strong bond of trust. And uh, a lot of that is, is looking after your guys. You, you've got to make sure, and when I say guys, I mean girls as well, of course, I'm, I'm sorry for the, the vernacular. Um, but you need to ensure that they are equipped, that they're trained, that they're mentally capable of, of facing whatever that you know, is coming their way. Mm. And that, require, that requires a great deal of nurturing and coaching. And, and I think that sort of coaching model is becoming, you know, the, the military has learned uh, from civilian life as well in that. They, they do a lot more coaching t- uh, style of leadership now, mm. whereas it used to be this sort of, you know, qu- quite a, a brusque um, uh, extroverts, a uh, strong man kind of uh, leadership you know that that's that, that's the way that people took it to be uh, now it's much more actually it's calm it's it's controlled and i remember um i, I remember taking uh, a squadron i was uh, uh, commanding it was about 160 people we went off to the falklands not not for the war i'm, I'm not that old but uh, we went down to the falklands for five months and mm-hmm. we took uh some territorial army so part-time soldiers with us and it was really interesting because at the end of the, this period down in the Falklands, I interviewed all of our um, territorial army people before they went back into civilian life. And I said, you know, how have you found it? And every one of them said, nobody shouts. And from that I took, that at that time, I think the territorial army or the reserves have changed a lot since then, but there was this... Uh, expectation that to, to lead people you had to shout at them yeah. whereas that's not what happens in the military most of the time at all it's about discussion it's about the, the, the whole thing of getting people to do uh, getting people to want to do 
what they have to do rather than just because they're told. And so that, that it, in that sense, the military's a lot more cerebral, a lot softer in its manner than people expect. There is a time for shouting, of course. There is a time for you know, you know, the adrenaline um, pumping. But actually, most of the time, uh, it, it's about working together as a team. Uh, and do you think that style was prevalent between the conflicts, and that actually, what you're doing there is building a capacity to have greater trust? So when you go to a more violent setting, that yeah. when when you need to shout because everybody needs to be able to you know command and control from time to time. Yeah. But but the sort of the, there's a sort of a, a body of or a bed of goodwill that's been built. Absolutely, up. yeah, and that's that's built partly through training. Uh, so you know you you rehearse the same uh, you know, you rehearse particular procedures so that when you you come into a difficult situation, everyone knows what to do and and can trust each other to do it. But also, as you know, as you say, it's it's about that that bonding, that team spirit. That's you know you you feel you can rely on each other and. Um, uh, I think Stephen Covey, uh, in his, uh, I don't know if you've read his book, uh, The Speed of Trust, but he talks about the two elements, two key elements of trust being, uh, the first one is competence. So you have to be good at your job. Um, and that's, that's all about training and it's about leadership style. Um, so, you've got, so you've got competence and you've got character. And so the second part is character. And if you are the kind of person who's just trying to rise to the top, who's trying to do everything for your own purposes, that is actually a character flaw. Um, and this is where the servant leadership comes in. If you, if you have got a character that is looking after your team and making sure they're equipped to do what you need them to do, that's, you know, that, that is, a, that is an excellent character to have. And, and you see that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be military. That's, a, you know, that's in civilian life as well. You can see it very clearly. And so it's not, ser- because the words become collect- um, sort of corrupted a little bit, because it's serve and lead- leading, isn't it, rather than servant. You're not, you're not the servant of your team, or is that? that well, yes and no. And um, there's a fantastic uh, civilian leadership um, uh, guru that I like, a guy called Peter Anderton, who actually lives fairly near me. Um, and he talks about leadership. Uh, there's two, two rules of leadership. One, it's all about you sorry first the first rule is it's not about you yeah. and then the second rule is it's all about you and what he means by that is it's not about who you are and how far you're going to get and how good you're going to be it's about your team because if you've developed your team properly they will naturally do what you need them, need them to do and the second point is it's it's all about you and that means it, all that has got to come from you so this this idea of servant leadership it, you're you're not you know, it's not rolling over and doing whatever your team want you to do, but it's about providing for them. It's about thinking of them first. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was that, don't quote me on this, although I'm on a podcast, so I should be able to quote myself. I think it was the, either the Duke of Marlborough or the Duke of Wellington or somebody like that said, mm-hmm. um, the, the, the priority is horses, men, and then yourself. That's right. Uh, and uh, this this whole idea of looking after your equipment and your people, and then you can look after yourself, is is, is really where it's at, where it's at. Yes, yeah, it's fascinating. And um, oh, we could talk to all day about that sort of thing, but we oh, we, we we just can't, can we? Because it's uh, it's such a fascinating. It's huge. Podcast. Yeah, it's it's not a leadership podcast. <laughs> no, but, but, but what's interesting as well as one of the other things you talked about is around resilience, such like because of course you talked about that mental. You didn't use the word, but sort of mental toughness, mental rigor, mental resilience, the ability to, to be able to grip yourself you mm-hmm. know, mentally mm-hmm. and, and manage your own thoughts. And you talked, you sort of alluded to that, that sort of yeah. toughness as you were talking about leadership. So, so can you sort of unpack that a little for me? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think based on what I've said, you know, that you'd expect people in the military to be mentally resilient. And in most cases, they are to a point. Mm-hmm. And you know we see we've seen a lot of uh, issues around um, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, depression, uh, and things like that with with you know f- with military people, and of course that you know cascades into civilian life, and um, with uh, people coming out of the military into civilian life. And I, I, if I can relate how that worked for me, uh, when I left the military, there is this, or there was then uh, at the time a tendency to say you've been in the military this is what you've got to offer 
in civilian life. You've got all this versatility, you've got all this resilience, you've got all this energy, which is all true. And you do get very well trained and, and you've got, you know, lots of very, very positive attributes. But it implies that you can sort of run through walls, which is yeah. clearly wrong. And um, what I found was I, I, I moved into a, a company that uh, was doing renewable energy. And then I set up my own company after a couple of years uh, doing renewable energy and ran that for nine years. And that was a very, very brutal time. Uh, the reason is, without going into too much detail about renewable, renewable energy, but it's, um, it, it's not a strong value proposition. People already have electricity. They already have heat. And there we were trying to sell um, other companies, you know, quarter of a million pound systems to put on their factory roof or whatever yeah. and they already have electricity so, so, so it's, it's a very difficult sell even though it's a good thing to do for the environment which i'm, I'm, I'm passionate about um and so there's this there's this long journey of trying to make something that, that you absolutely believe in work and that requires huge resources financially emotionally um, mentally to keep that going and what I found was, uh, even though I'd been tremendously well prepared um, for being resilient in the military, and you know I felt like I could, I could run through walls, there was this, you know, over a period of nine years of running my own company, during which we got an investment as well, so it was, you know, it, it was all good. Um, it gradually er eroded the uh, ability to um, be resilient and uh, and it, 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 it made uh, it made it very very difficult and in fact I did go through a period of having depression um, because it, it had crept up on me by degrees and I, I you know I wasn't prepared for that and of course that you know being in the military you you know you don't expect that to happen to you because you can run through walls mm. so I know that you, you you're you're focused very much on this resilience and, and I would you know, commend that but I would also say that you know being resilient you have to also be very very self-aware of what is going on and know when to take breaks when 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 it is time to say this isn't working we need to ch we need to change tack it isn't just about um what I was told you know when I started my business which was you know if you persevere if you persevere if you persevere you will succeed that isn't actually the case and it's I know you're right and that's not resilience either and I think people exactly. and I think people misunderstand what resilience is all about in that sense it's the state this strong and wavering stubbornness that you know which which is a risk isn't it because if you have strong and wavering st stubbornness and you're on the wrong path that, that doesn't get you the right answer um, absolutely absolutely and I, and, and, I like your analogy about uh, the allusion to self-awareness because it is it's part of self-awareness and then self-management it's the two things coming together isn't it mm -hmm, absolutely and it, and, it, and it can be very and i think you know being sexist it, it's um it, it is particularly difficult for men um because you you know we have we you know, certainly men of a certain age we have this sort of legacy of you know you know, boys don't cry or men don't cry um yeah. and uh you know we have to be the provide the providers and the breadwinners and so on and of course that's you know that's all largely nonsense but um that is nevertheless the the cultural uh uh paradigm that we've been brought up in and so it, it it's it, in many ways it's a healthy thing to come across a situation where you can't cope in order that you then take a reality check and go ah that isn't the way the world works after all yeah and of course the ability to get things wrong and bounce back is actually resilient so you have to you have to uh, you have to be able i'm doing the bunny ears now but it's you have parenthesis but you have to be able to fail <laughs> you have to be able to fail in order to do the learning and i think Absolutely. a lot of people who have this idea that you just grit your teeth and continue yeah. on don't don't fail and therefore they never learn yeah. And I think lots of very fragile people who are like that. And um, and what I was going back to is this idea that in the in the army, I wonder if I wonder if you guys are trained so you get a structure in the way you think about yourselves, which works in a particular context, but doesn't necessarily work in the context of civilian life because you lose that that more structured. Um, yeah, I, it's a that's a really living. interesting. That's a really interesting point. I think there's probably more work done, done on that now. When you talk about structure, the thing I would pick up on there is that the military is a very structured, very hierarchical, very institutionalized uh, place to work. Mm. 
And because of that, you know, for many people that's anathema, you know, it is it's just awful. But actually for many people that is yes. a very comfortable place to be. You know, you know your place, you know yeah. where you are, you know what your job is, and there's huge comfort in that. Yes. So that when you're put when when the when the the organization is put under pressure, wow. everyone can can perform to the limits of their ability because they know what they're supposed to do and uh, and they are you 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 very rarely see someone promoted more than one rank above the the, the limits of their capability you know that you simply mm -hmm. you do see see it quite a lot where people are promoted and then don't manage particularly well in that rank but that's you know that and then it stops and uh, and what that means is most people are performing to their ability or thereabouts, which is you know. And I think there's there's a, there's a corporate resilience there that is that is kind of built in, and of course that that uh, transfers to individual resilience as well. Mm. That's fascinating. Actually, I'm just thinking about the personality traits that link to being institutionalised or not, because actually, if you've and you often find this with people who are coming out of prisons as well, don't you? That. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, you know that actually they often reoffend, and what they often, what some people say, not all, obviously, but actually there's a security in prison because actually everything's done for you. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and indeed, I, I had one. Uh, I, I've got to be very careful what I say for obviously course. confidentiality reasons. But uh, one of my team at one point in my career, so I could, that's pretty vague, isn't it? Um, they had come to the end of their 22 years of service. And in the last year of service, we noticed them become very unstable as yeah. the thought of leaving the institution was uh, w w was creeping up on them. And sadly, that's why you know, we, we do see quite a lot of um, ex-service people on the streets because it's not it's not because they're weak. It's not because they're unable to cope. It's just because they have got so used to over a long period of time a particular structured way of doing things when that's taken away it's very very difficult to uh, to 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 resolve that i think that's i think that's an interesting point isn't it it's that that we re and it's interesting your point about tra training we we see a hell of a lot of training development but it's very situational it's very driven around a specific context yeah. and so we very rarely get, and i think that's interesting what you point about coaching because coaching applies across many contexts and yeah. you know it's finding those themes that's sort of you know um you know bridge many contexts and things which is which is interesting um it, it's interesting i was on, i was on a cruise ship once and um mm. that's not a surprise for people that know me because <laughs> and um I, I we I, my wife and i were i forget where we were going, going to america i think and um mm -hmm. three week cruise and um we bumped into a family or two families and we asked them what they were doing there and they said they just got off a world trip and we said, well, what was that like? And they said, it was great. But he said, we really missed the cruise ship. I said, well, why? He said, well, we've been institutionalized because we've been on a cruise for four months. Wow. All of our food was prepared. Everything was there. Everything was looked after. All our schedules decided, you know, what we wore, how it worked. They got off the cruise ship and within a week were so disorganized and so chaotic, they had to find another cruise almost immediately. Isn't and, you know, I've never put that together with that, you know, I've never put that together, that idea with, with almost um, not just institutional um, institutionalization, but actually yeah. cultural and social, because mm -hmm, we, do, mm -hmm. we do actually like to belong to clubs, don't we? And we do oh, like yeah, absolutely. Follow, and, and, like and, the, and the military is a, is a very strong case in point because yeah. you've got you've got the, the, the corporals' mess, you've got the sergeants' mess, you've got the officers' mess, and uh, you know these are all clubs where you know you you have to you know you, there is a certain status there you have to be in the military for a period of time before you can enter those clubs um you do you have certain traditions within those clubs so that is you know that is um a huge part of of, of that institution um I, you know, one of the one of the sadnesses is that uh for cost-cutting reasons you know a lot a lot of that is has been eroded and taken away yeah. but it, you know, which is a weakness because of course it's 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 vital to that esprit de corps to to make sure that people can go go overseas and do unpleasant things yeah and and it's interesting when you think about strategy and you know, and i know we're jumping around a little bit here but mm. i do meet people in my work in lodge organizations where actually there is a very very institutionalized culture and people who are uh, and maybe a new leader who's sort of railing against the culture, but the culture works. An institutionalized yeah. culture works for people who need to be institutionalized. And if you think about that servant leader thing, actually, they need that culture in order to be the best version of themselves. 
And I yeah. wonder whether this sort of idea of destructive or not destructive, but more, um, um, well, maybe destructive leadership is, is actually an issue because you need that, you need that destruction in order to sometimes, it's not destruction, I don't mean that. I mean, um, you know, in restless leadership where you, yeah. you throw the cards up in the air, you need that to make change happen. And yet actually mm. you're disturbing people at quite a fundamental level in some cases. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and of course, sometimes there is a need for that change because yeah. people have got into uh, into habits that they shouldn't get into. I, I remember one, it, it wasn't a, a, a mess situation, but um, when I was working for a multinational headquarters, I remember one exercise, you know, bear in mind this headquarters was, was fairly static. It would move occasionally when it was on um, operations. But um, uh, we did an exercise when uh, uh, the, the general in charge said, okay, um, we're going to move headquarters right now. And everyone went, what do you mean right now? We normally, we normally get 48 hours notice to move. And, and, and he said, no, everyone move right now. Yeah. And he, he forced the issue. And everyone came out. They had suitcases on wheels. I mean, imagine this in the military. They've got suitcases <laughs> on wheels and stuff. And, and, and you know, uh, seven bags. And it was, like, it was, it was just this uh, you know, retreat from Stalingrad kind of nonsense that was going on. People not able to cope with a, an immediate change. And, and he had to force the issue to say, look, we are... Uh, you know we're, we're a field headquarters we should be able to move instantly because you know you might, we might get you know, mortared or something like that yeah. uh you you can't come out with three suitcases and expect to expect to be able to do that so you know it's a trivial trivial point but you know sometimes you need to just shake shake things up a bit and make people realize what their actual function is it's, it's interesting i used to work in a very um, vibrant consultancy many years ago and mm. When anyone went on holiday, we used to change their desk around and move everything in. You know, yeah. Sometimes it was a joke because everything, when they came out, was stapled to the ceiling. But most of the time, it was just about <laughs> taking that opportunity to shake things up. And yeah. you know, what we created was an incredibly agile culture because actually yeah. people used to change. And, and what you see a lot in organizations is this, um, an old colleague of mine used to describe it as the fur-lined rut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, you know, becomes very comfortable and, and it's not a rut of rust. It's a rut because actually everyone's very comfortable and happy and, and this idea of, you know, let's build our habits, let's, you know, execute. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need a sort of a, a shock. And I yeah. think, you know, with Brexit coming along in, in our country uh, or some of the other changes which are going on in the world, this is an ideal time for organizations and people to be shaking themselves up because we've got awfully comfortable over the last 10 years since the last big recession. In fact, you know, I talk to people. I talk to people who've almost forgotten it. Yeah, it's ten years ago, isn't it? I mean, ten years ago for some people is yeah. you know their entire working life. And I think yeah, I, and I think that shock is you know there are there are definite positive positives to it. Mm -hmm. um, the the other thing you mentioned agility there, and I think it, being agile is is often seen as the the thing to be desired. Um, but of course, if you're agile, then it's difficult to get into a place where you are because you're you're very efficient at your processes. So, um, when I was working in a, in a tactical headquarters, um, it, 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 rolling around the prairie in tanks, um, there was probably up to ten different procedures that that we would do as an organisation, or that each individual would be, would be expected to do, and you'd just you'd practice those those ten different things over and over again, and you'd become really really good at it. Now, yes, of course, we could do other things, but uh, you could say actually, even even though it looked like a very agile organisation, we were only performing one of ten different functions. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, and, and but doing it very very well indeed and I, I think for companies and i've seen this myself where you know you've got companies who are who've got their processes down to an absolute t you know they're shaving off you know fractions of a percent margin by just tweaking and refining and so on you start to become uh uh very rigid in that exactly. and, and you lose agility so yeah. you have I, I think as a leader you have to go well do we want that or do we want to become more agile do we want to have do, do we want to have part of the organization that is ready to move and pivot into another area or do we want everybody you know very 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 uh, refined and finessed in what they're doing and, and that's fascinating because i mean the whole concept of the the lean movement was to get efficiency and agile yeah. and um it's a moot and of course it depends because of course a lot of um this work happens in places with a lot of heavy machinery. You've got, you've got 100,000 tanks. Yeah. You know, it's only the people that can be agile <laughs> that, 
the machinery can't be, can it? And yeah. it's the same with a lot of processes. It's, yes, the processes are as only as agile as they can be, but you know, if you're building a vehicle or you know, yeah. creating a piece of um, medicine or something, you've still got a, you know a regulatory um, process to follow. You, and so actually the point about it being agile is which bits can be, I suppose. And it's the same in life, isn't it? Because often what we see in life is that our family holds us back and we want to do things. But the process of the family means that we can't because they're the bit that's intractable in our life, potentially, not always. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, for, I mean you, you wrote in three areas are particularly fascinating for me. So, I'm going to stop my, I'm going to manage, I'm going to be respectful of your time and, and make sure I don't <laughs> here all day. But um, tell me what it's like to, um, I mean, I've failed in a company as well. So, I'm fascinated to hear about your experience of, of, of that, that yeah. business problem, really. Yeah, well, well, you know, going, just just recapping on what we were doing. So we were we were providing renewable energy solutions, uh, both solar and biomass. That's burning wood uh, to uh, to other business clients. Um, and, you know, project values of between fifty thousand and three four hundred thousand. And uh, it, it, it the, the whole issue was around the value proposition. We were we were very good at what we did. Uh, generally generally good design good installation um but we kept falling down on not being able to uh, uh generate a steady uh revenue stream and a steady op- you know opportunity pipeline and it, it even got to the point where i mentioned we had investment we we, we you know, got investment from a, a multi-billion dollar japanese company um and they, they dropped some money into the company so that we could generate a um a pipeline <laughs> interestingly i mean you mentioned brexit and the opportunities of brexit that happened pretty much at exactly the same time as the referendum vote hit ah, yeah and what happened was uh we had all this money to spend on sales which we did uh but um everybody stopped buying uh, the, you know, we were very involved in manufacturing and the whole manufacturing sector i think we were we were sort of a canary in the mine really uh, the, the whole manufacturing sector basically said well we're actually selling more now because the exchange rates dropped and you know, we, 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 our exports have gone up, which is fantastic, but we don't know where we're going to be in two years time. So thanks very much, but we'll not buy. Mm. And so we had, a, we had about a 7 million pound opportunity pipeline that, that dried up pretty much overnight. Now, um, what I should have done and, you know, going back to the whole sort of resilience and decision-making and, and what I'm doing now strategy, what I should have you know, looked at was the risk of that happening. Yes. But of course, you know, well, who, who thought that Brexit, you know, the referendum was actually going to go that way? Not many. Is the, is the, so I, I take some comfort in that. But what, what I should have done was say, if, if this happens and if we have a hiatus in sales, uh, then we should then minimize the company and, uh, and you know, and go, to a, go down to a skeleton crew straight away in order that we can ride out that, uh, that, that particular sure. situation. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, I didn't do that. That was my fault, and uh, uh, you know, we 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 ended up you know, just basically bleeding bleeding out um, in terms of the, the, the resources we had. Mm-hmm. So it was very 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 painful. And, and of course, when, you know, going back to the resilience and mental health, when you're in that position and you've got huge pressure internally as well as externally to perform, options don't come easily to your to your mind. It's you know, you're just trying the same thing harder and harder and harder yeah. and, and and it still isn't working and um you know we're not we're just touching briefly on on what i'm doing now that with the strategy work what, one of the things i find interesting is talking to companies about their goals so um every, everyone is generally used to setting goals and you know people say well we, we did 10 million turnover this year therefore we'll do 11 million turnover next year yeah well justify that you know wh- wh- where where is your analysis that is going to allow that to happen or are you just going to beat salespeople over the head with a big stick and mm-hmm. say sell 10 percent more and that's actually what most people do is they just well it's it's it, we, we feel that target's probably all right we'll just beat people up a bit more and make people a bit more efficient um and and that's essentially what the strategy is so what i'm some of the work i'm doing is 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 around how do we define those goals and actually how do we how do we build up a strategy to deliver them properly yeah and that's fascinating isn't it because thinking forward looking at the risk mitigating the risk is actually part of business process but it's part of life and it's also part of anxiety management 
because Absolutely. people don't realize it's exactly the same process about, you know, if we all knew the future, <laughs> wouldn't life be great? But well, the point yeah. about planning and risk assessment is about yeah. understanding that there may be many futures and actually being ready for any of them. And therefore you look planned and prepared and therefore anxiety levels drop, pressure drops. And at least, at least it's something unexpected happens. You're ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, you, 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 you talk about Brexit and I talk about Brexit and, and the, you know, rightly or wrongly, that's where we're going. It's interesting to see which companies have prepared for that and gone, okay, yes. what, what happens if we have to move overseas? What happens if we have, if, if we've got a 10% rise in uh, import costs? And, and those companies that have gone through that in detail and worked that the scenarios, there may not be, you know, in some of those cases, there may not be very many happy endings with the scenario that they're planning for, but at least they'll know what it looks like when it arrives. And you also, and can, you're also planning when you have the cash to plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what happens is people start planning when, when they, what's it's hit the fan. And, and it just happens in all, you know, all walks of life and personal life, you know, it's, that, it becomes, it's a crisis planning. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes crisis management. You know, I, and as I've, as I've alluded to, you know, I've been there, I know what it's like. It's not yeah. a pleasant place to be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that's why I'm trying, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing now is because I, you know, I don't want other people to experience what I experienced. Yeah. So, so typically what sort of organizations do you tend to work with now then? Uh, well, mostly um, SMEs. Um, so it, it's it's where you've still got that. Um, you, know, the, you you don't have people with MBAs. You don't have departments just looking at risk. You know that that the, the large corporates are, are frankly. Um, are probably thinking about this stuff already. Well, <laughs> I hope oh, in, not always. <laughs> in some cases they are. Um, but yeah, the, the SME environment where you're dealing with uh, very tangible teams and, 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 you're, and you're looking to, um, to work with those teams in a particular way, that, that's where my, my, my skill set is really. Yeah, fascinating. And so, Carl, if people want to, to have a look at your website or maybe consider how they could get to talk to you a bit more depth because i know you offer this this idea of almost like um the, the pair um someone who wants may want to talk to you we can have this sort of idea of a virtual walk together which yeah that's right like. yeah well a virtual walk or, or an actual walk um the but the yeah it's very I, I don't do hard sell and um what i'm keen to do you know i, I I'm, I'm very much enjoying being on your podcast and i, and I used to run my own podcast because I just love talking to people about their businesses and finding out what is going well and what is not going so well. Uh, so um, we can be found at um, refreshbusiness.co.uk. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, Carl Benfield. Uh, very easy to find. And um, if anybody wants to just chat about what we're offering, um, very happy to do that. And there's no obligation, etc. It's just gen genuinely interested in, in uh, how your company is doing and whether we can provide any support or not I, I, mm. and frankly i'd be very happy to say do you know what there's nothing we can do that's not our skill set um I, I do work with uh, a a number of other consultants as associates uh we do have varying skill sets so there's generally something we can do um but uh, of course that depends on availability mm. excellent carl it's been a, a real pleasure to you i've been absolutely fascinated i think um You've certainly got me thinking. I've actually, um, I mean, this, this doesn't always happen, but I always say when it does, I've got a big page of notes in front of me um, of, of ideas and sort of thoughts and such like. So thank you for that. Um, Pleasure. And I think this podcast has been relevant for anyone in business, but anybody who's you know, thinking about the broad subject as well, because everything you said is relatable to personal lives as well as mm -hmm. business lives. So it's been fascinating. Well, it's been my pleasure. Thanks very much indeed for having me on. We hope you found today's podcast useful. If you did, why not subscribe and listen to our other podcasts? We would love it if you could leave us a review. To access our resilience coaching, contact us at info at qedod.com. And finally, if you'd like to download our free resilience ebook, go to qedod.com slash free ebook. Thanks for listening.